Okay, everyone, I'm so sorry. I wasn't sure if there was gonna be a formal introduction at the front end of this. So let me go ahead and begin. Um, I'm Dr. Ramane Dervasala. I am a clinical psychologist, a professor of psychology, but sort of what I've become more sort of known for in the public sphere is my work on narcissism and narcissistic personality and all kinds of human relationships. A lot of it is around the intimate relationship space, but also in the workplace. And in this today, what we're gonna really talk about is in the divorce space and more specifically in co-parenting. So let's talk about this, okay? Which is, I, I call it the daily impossible. If you are indeed co-parenting with a narcissist. Now, if you're not, then you know, you know that co-parenting can actually be a rather smooth, um, really sort of uh, mutually beneficial process. It may not be what you signed up for. It may not be optimal, but it can work. With a narcissist, it literally every day, you are bowled over by a new challenge. So let me... Um, let me walk you through sort of in very basic terms, and then I'll sort of break down what do we mean by what a narcissist is, you know, how does this play out in, in, a, in sort of the natural history of your relationship, and how does this very specifically play out in parenting. There are numerous challenges that are raised by co-parenting with a narcissist. And just to get some clarity, when I use this term, narcissist, I'm really talking about somebody who lacks empathy, is entitled, grandiose, they may be prone to rage, they don't do well under conditions of frustration or disappointment, they are um, they're constantly seeking validation, they often feel quite victimized, they're very plagued by sort of shame, and then they'll have more rage under those conditions, they can be very controlling, um, they can be very sensitive to criticism, but there's a hypocrisy to it because they'll be very sensitive to criticism, but then they'll have no problem criticizing and saying terrible things to other people. They're deeply manipulative and this typically manifests as gaslighting or them denying your reality. I never said that. You're making too big a deal out of this. And so it, interestingly, when you did the post-mortem of your relationship, and I'm assuming you're on this obviously because you're divorced given the nature of the, you know, of the program, that you look back on the marriage and you're like, oh my goodness, I saw this from the beginning, but I chose to ignore it for any number of reasons. So all of those challenges that were there during your marriage because of this narcissistic personality style are all going to play out in co-parenting. And co-parenting doesn't end at the age of 18. While some of the most critical sorts of legal thickets might get crossed, even as the children go into adulthood, you very much want to be a part of their lives. And in fact, different kinds of games get played with money. And you know, again, validation seeking is validation seeking. And what better way to stick it to you than to really sort of seek the validation of kids and then be able to control them as puppets. Money is often that thing that we see in adult relationships then you have graduations, you have weddings, you have grandchildren. And so it is a lifelong journey you're preparing for or that you're already in. If you are co-parenting with a narcissist, these are among some of the leading challenges that you're going to face is a sense of constantly being undermined. I always say that co-parenting with a narcissist is a bit like single parenting with an elephant on your back who's also got your eyes covered. Like you are carrying so much more burden. It would actually be easier to be a solo parent completely than to have to co-parent with a narcissist because your decisions are undermined. Your discipline is undermined. The routines you have for them is undermined. And if you have shared custody, you may honestly feel that the first few days you have your children back from your partner really consist of you having to get your kids back on a new schedule and your entire life feels like this sort of eternal struggle of getting your kids back on a schedule. You will face criticism. You will face contempt of your parenting everything you're doing wrong, your lifestyle, you name it, it will be dismissed contemptuously. You will see very, very poor boundaries. They will contact you at times that are inappropriate. They will constantly be violating what are supposed to be the rules of conduct. They will not use the parenting app that they're supposed to communicate through. There's lots of game playing, baiting, shape-shifting. They're one way to one group of people. And so you will deal with the eternal frustration that the school may actually think they're a nice parent or the pediatrician may actually be on board with them. And you feel like you're constantly walking through an alternative universe. And just when you set a plan with them, they'll move the goalposts again. So really you have to be deeply in touch with your own reality to be able to tolerate this. Gaslighting is sort of central 
to the challenge of co-parenting with a narcissist. And gaslighting, in essence, is having your reality denied and manipulated in many, many different ways, so much so that you feel confused and you start doubting yourself. The gaslighting started in the marriage. You saw it from, it probably started when you were dating and it will plague you while you attempt to co-parent. It will be many times, I already sent that message. I already signed that form and you'll go back and the form's not signed, but how much time do you waste going back to see that things were actually done? You will also be dealing with a lot of grief. The grief is often that this is not what I imagined for my kids. I didn't imagine my kids having to go back and forth between multiple homes or dealing with step parent struggles or dealing with manipulation. This is not what I wanted. Some of you may have had a, a narcissistic parent and you feel like, how did I recreate this for my child? Some of you may have not had very healthy parents and said, what is this? But there's a lot of grief over something that you feel that you lost, that you didn't get to create this family structure for your child you wanted. You can't go back and recreate it. This is always going to be a challenge. And so again, there's a lot of loss that needs to be processed. Another challenge is not wanting to get in the mud with them. Many times you're going to want to explain yourself and defend yourself. I need you to see my point of view they're never going to see your point of view. And so disengaging as much as you can with a co-parent, which isn't always easy. It's not like a boss or a, you know, or someone you were dating and you don't have kids with or something. You do have to have ongoing contact with this person. And I'm hoping by the end of today, I will have taught you how not to over-engage with them. You live in confusion all the time, which is why having healthy supports or therapy becomes so important. You become concerned. What if my child turns out this way? What if the influence of this co-parent on them and their entitlement and their obsession with having the shiny new thing and, and buying them off with gifts and you know all the really rude dismissive behavior, many, many people who co-parent with a narcissist have that really dark day and it usually comes around puberty, adolescence, where the child starts mirroring a lot of the speech and the style and the dismissiveness of their narcissistic parent. And that starts the whole grief cycle again. Lots of triangulation, which is the chaos that gets created when, for example, the, the, your co-parent uses talks through your child, uses your child as a messenger. Triangulation puts all the power sometimes in the hands of the person leading the triangulation. Those of you who may have come from narcissistic family systems may have remembered how one parent would often turn the siblings against each other or extended family against each other. Triangulation can also happen though when you're co-parenting. You may also um, find yourself having to observe your own child's pain. Watching your child go through the confusion, the watching the, you know, having a, ch a child having to listen to one parent criticize another is an extraordinarily painful experience. And so you have to watch that. Then there's gaslighting by other members of your family or your, your former in-laws. That becomes a big part of this where, especially if you were once close to those in-laws, it can feel really painful because you may have enjoyed their company. And now you feel like there's people saying, well, it couldn't have been that bad or she's not that bad or he's not that bad. And you're like, oh my gosh, like, do these people not see it? They don't want to see it. I don't know if they can't see it. They don't want to. The courts don't get this. They don't get this. And a, a dear friend of mine, a woman named Tina Swithin, some of you may be familiar with her work. She is right now actually embarking on a whistle stop tour across the country, trying to work with family courts across the United States and create more education and knowledge of what narcissism is to custody evaluators, judges, because until they get it, these bad decisions are going to be made. Uh, money, money is forever going to be the tool. If you're your, if your former partner, if your co-parent is a narcissist with money, they will use it to punish you. They will use it to torture you. They will use it to control you. And then they will do the same thing to your kids. It is exhausting. You are going to be, this is a stress like no other. And so if you feel like maybe there's something wrong with me, there's nothing wrong with you. You're being put under an honestly an inhumane kind of a condition. You are also going to be stuck in this balancing act of protecting your child while remaining authentic. That's a fancy way of me saying you cannot tell your child what a monstrous person your co-parent is. You don't get to throw the other parent under the bus, even though you're like, I just want to tell them what I'm up against. 
that is a story that's going to have to unfold for them as they go into adulthood. Many kids will get it, not all will. What you never are going to want to do, never going to want to gaslight your child. And we'll talk about that. So you don't have to say your dad is a hero. Your mom is an angel. You don't want to send them a bad bill of goods. But to find the delicate way of having a conversation of saying, I, that sounds really hard. Are you okay? Do you want to talk about how you're feeling? It can be very confusing. Sometimes adults, you know, don't behave in the best way. You know, those using these very broad terms. So no one can ever catch you in the whole saying, well, your dad's a jerk, which you don't get to say. And then there's always the projection they're going to put on you over and over and over again. When you're co-parenting with a narcissist, you're going to get the texts and the late night emails and the phone messages. You're a terrible mother. You're a terrible father. You are such a bad parent on and on and on. And that's their projection because at some deep primitive level, they're in touch with the fact that they don't know what they're doing, but they're never going to admit to it. The fears of co-parenting with a narcissist can be all absorbing. Some of these include questions like people wondering, what is this going to do to my kids? And I'm going to talk to you in a minute. It's not good. Okay. I'm going to tell you now, no kid walks out of this unscathed. What happens when this person remarries? The only thing I can guarantee is that the person they remarry is also going to be treated as bad as you, but in the initial part, it's not going to seem like that. Narcissist doesn't change. What if I remarry? You're going to need to engage in education with your new partner about what it was you're dealing with and find a way to do that gently because I'll be honest with you, your new partner is going to have to now manage this stress and watch you not only have to deal with these attacks, but your new partner new spouse is also going to have to be able to weather those storms too. Not everyone is up to the challenge. And the fair thing is to let them really be prepared for what it is you're dealing with. And then the ultimate question, and there's no great answer to this. What if they actually succeed in what they've been setting out to do of pushing a wedge between me and my children? I wish I could sugarcoat this, but I have definitely seen them be able to do it where they, they, whether it was through money, whether it was through manipulation, whether it was through lies, however they did it, they managed to succeed in terms of pushing that wedge so your children believe the, narcissist's, um, the narcissist narrative and they will distance from you. And no matter how hard you try, your child doesn't come back around. Does that sometimes happen? It does. And I'm hoping that some of the tips I give you might lessen the likelihood of that. But in some cases, sadly, the narcissist is that good or maybe that bad that they're able to get you there. What are some of the tricks you need to keep in your back pocket? Above all else, you are going to be a documenter at such a degree that someday you're probably going to need a storage unit for all the documentation you came up with. I remember once years ago consulting on a extraordinarily malignant narcissistic divorce. Um, it was awful. And the people had a lot of money. The law firm actually had to rent extra office space to hold all the records from this divorce. The divorce ended up costing multi seven figures just in legal fees. Documentation though is everything, which is why you use apps, the communication apps, because that allows for a running record to be to be kept and replies to be tracked. But it is about saving every voicemail, every text message, every email. It's about cameras in your house. It is a horrible way to live. But if these things, especially when you have younger children and you have to keep showing up and there's more and more hearings, the only thing that these systems can work with is documentation. And even with documentation, it's sometimes not enough. You also have to have realistic expectations. I have watched many people get destroyed by, oh, when I finally tell somebody the story and I tell someone how narcissistic my co-parent is, then it's going to come together. It absolutely will not. The courts don't care. They do not care that your partner is narcissistic. And in fact, you can never, ever, ever use that word. And I will talk about that. You say that word, now all of a sudden you're the bad parent in court. So you have to have very realistic expectations. This is going to be a rough ride. You are never going to be that sort of, whatever, what was that called? Consciously uncoupled, happy, blissfully, friendly, you know, uh, co-parenting couple. It ain't going to be that. It is always going to be tough. You are always going to need support. 
you are, you're going to, you have to prepare yourself for a marathon. This isn't like, oh, and he's going to remarry or she's going to remarry and everything's going to be fine. Nah, they still need their punching bag. And that's going to remain you because the kids remain the bridge. You also have to have the realistic expectations that they may actually try to get 50% custody, not because they want to be with the kids, but because it's to punish you. And then watch your kids be confused and maybe even disappointed. Wednesday nights are supposed to be at dad's and yet another Wednesday night that they've canceled. So you're often picking up the pieces of the numerous disappointments your children have to endure because that's what narcissists do. They let people down. But like I said, the big struggle here is I've got to teach you how to talk about narcissism without saying the word. Custody evaluators, um, uh, GALs, guardians at litem, and uh, judges, most importantly judges, do not want to hear you say that word. Tina is a much better historian of all this. I, she's actually been sort of like, she's an advocate. And so we work together on a lot of this, but it is, they don't want to hear the word. And part of it is because I think at some level, the cynic in me wonders how many of the judges and people who do this work might be narcissistic themselves, but that notwithstanding is there's no, there's nothing they can work with there. You know, they're saying at the end of the day, the, the court is working from a place of rights. And the other biological parent or the other parent, documented parent, they have rights under the law. This isn't about quality of parenting. This isn't even about quality of life. This is about the court making a, de a decision on division of assets and your child is an asset. The court is not making a decision on what's good for your child. Every so often I hear the unicorn, the judge who saw what a jerk the narcissist is and decided and made the decision that was good for the kids. But I'll be frank with you, that decision typically only came after multiple rounds in court. And those kids have already been relatively shredded by repeated exposure to that narcissistic parent. Um, so I'm gonna teach you other adjectives you can use instead of saying the word narcissistic. It's about radical acceptance that this does not change. By and large, the clinical literature, and I know this because I've worked with narcissistic clients, it doesn't get better. It doesn't get changed. And not only that, it often gets worse as the narcissist gets older. But if you, if you turn off this webinar now and you're done, like I don't want to listen to you anymore. I got something else to do. I'm busy. And you only walk off with one thing. This is what I want you to walk off with, which is the ultimate survival skill. So I put it here. I'll build it out a little deeper, but I know many of you are busy is I don't want you to over-engage with this person. I don't want you to defend yourself to this person. And I don't want you to keep explaining yourself to this person. You have to engage with this person, right? You don't get to go fully no contact. You can barely use a technique we call gray rock. And gray rocking is when you sort of have this rather emotionless, very like you answer yes, no, sure, okay. You see how my expression's not changing? Like, it's a little infuriating, but it's also, there's no there there. After a while, a narcissist would get bored with that. Because you have parents together, I mean, because you have children together, that makes it harder. Tina writes about something called yellow rock. And yellow rock is where you let a little bit more emotion in, but you still don't fully give in to sort of the toxicity of this interaction. But you don't engage in optional interaction you don't need. This is not gonna be your friend, all right? But above all, even more important than that is the not defending and the ex not explaining. One thing that narcissistic co-parents often do is they're like, why? Why did you do that? Tell me why you did that. You, you don't owe them that answer. It, you did it, whatever it was. You don't need to tell them the why. They're not entitled to that. And what many people do is they fall into the mud. I'm going to explain to them because da-da-da, they need a homework routine. Da they're actually not listening to you. In fact, they didn't listen to you for the entire marriage. So do you think all of a sudden one day they're going to wake up and say, oh, really? The multiplication tables? Gotcha. No. And so you defending and you explaining is just you engaging in a very stressful interaction. That's just an opportunity for them to yell at you more, to undermine you more, and to criticize you more. So the defending and the explaining have no place in this. Something is done, say, it's done, I've done it. You have to do the training, whether it's mindfulness, whether it's meditation, whether it's breathing, to see all their stormy rage. 
I'm assuming it's not violent. Obviously, violence is a whole different story. But and then just distance and realize that this is a child throwing a tantrum. You're all parents. You've done. You've dealt with a screaming three-year-old. Your spouse is just a screaming 43-year-old or 53-year-old. That's all it is. It's just an adult having a tantrum. You tend to ignore your child when they have a tantrum. And since there's no real equivalent of timeout for grownups, part of that timeout is don't defend, don't explain. Think of how much time you've wasted as a co-parent defending and explaining. And I always tell people, write the text once. That's where you're doing all the explain, right? The first time you write the text, and this is why, and da, 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 and la, la, la. And before you know it, the text goes into that thing where it's so long, you got to push the little thing to read the whole text. Then I want you to delete that text and write the second text, just the facts, not defending, not explaining, just the facts, okay? Because explanations are not necessary. You may need to tell them, you may need to tell them about appointment or school, whatever, whatever your parenting agreement is, but just the facts. Because narcissists, when you go start doing the defending and explaining, they're baiting you. They want to fight. But you need good advocates. And this isn't, you, ideally, you have a good attorney, okay? But you may not be relying on the attorney anymore. This could be other advocates in, in, in the world of co-parenting. This could be a great therapist. And you need a community of people who are going through this, which I, I see that, for example, Talking Parents is a great example of that kind of community. You need, you need reality checks. You need people to say, this isn't okay, or I'm so sorry you're going through this, or this is, this is too much for one person to bear up under. Because a lot of people feel like they're failing when they're co-parenting with a narcissist. And Tina puts out this, this guidance, which I love. She says, as long as you're co-parenting with a narcissist, you always need to think forensically. And what she means by that is you're constantly gathering the evidentiary base because if things are not where you want them in terms of healthcare decision making, educational decision making, um, simply custody agreements, whatever it is, thinking forensically and always thinking about what evidence do I need to gather, you need to think like that. This person is not on your team. And that's the challenge here. Okay, it may not be naturally what comes to you, but you do need to think about what evidence this means sometimes hour by hour diaries, daily diaries, days that they don't follow through and on and on you need that kind of information. I see that there's many, many questions. So if I stopped and answered questions, I think this would end up going the whole time. So let me at least get to some key points here about what we mean by narcissism. So I don't mean to overwhelm you with all these words, but this is what it is. And a lot of times, the big mistake is a lot of people like, yeah, you know, a narcissist, he or she loves themselves. First of all, they don't love themselves. They actually have a lot of self-loathing, which is why sort of it is what it is. But what we see is, is patterns of behavior and patterns of relating that take in a lot of territory, including, like I said, the things I've talked about. They lack empathy. They're manipulative. They project their issues on other people. And they don't take responsibility for anything. They always shift blame to other people. There's a lot of lying. They have really poor boundaries. Um, they feel like they feel entitled to get in touch with people whenever they want. You should drop what you're doing to have to deal with whatever they want you to deal with. There's a lot of jealousy, the gaslighting I talked about, a lot of contempt and control and all these other things, rage, which is can be really, really problematic because it's unsettling not only for you, but also for your children. But at the core of all of this, the narcissist is deeply fragile and deeply insecure. In fact, that may, be, may have been way back in the day what initially drew you like, ah, oh, the world doesn't understand this person. No, they think the world doesn't understand them, but they're deeply insecure and they're off, they often feel quite victimized. They feel like nobody's on their team. Everybody's out to get them. It can almost feel like a paranoia at times, but they're deeply insecure. So they view everything in the world as being a threat. When we think about what narcissism is though, some of you may have dealt with grandiose narcissists. I'm the king of the world. I'm the big guy, or I'm the powerful woman, or I'm the lioness, or whatever it is. And those grandiose narcissists tend to be quite pretentious, and they tend to be quite arrogant. But when we talk about the vulnerable narcissist, that's the part of narcissism that a lot of people don't talk about, but actually can be really tricky when you're trying to co-parent. The vulnerable narcissist, they're often called covert narcissist. That's where this term is, the same thing. Vulnerable and covert narcissist are the same thing. These are the people who always feel resentful, sullen, and victimized. 
They feel like the world never gave them what they deserve, that everybody's out to get them. They're very hypersensitive. You might have noticed that early in your dating relationship, one tiny little critique by you or someone else would spin them out. Very, very fragile. And again, very angry at the world. Their mentality is the world doesn't see that I deserve to be the king of the world, but the world is sort of out to get me. You can see with a covert narcissistic co-parent, there is a lot of that sullen, resentful, victimized stance. And that actually can play upon a sense of guilt, not only in you, but also in your children, especially as they get older. Why, why is mommy and daddy always so sad? And their lives don't ever quite seem to launch. And so there's all, they all, a lot of people, like I said, basically feel very, very sorry for them, which can make it difficult for you. But this is not always a, it created the same for everyone, right? It's not a black and white term. It's very much on a continuum. At the milder end, we see these people are sub-threshold, sub-clinically narcissistic. They have those patterns. And if anything, they're sort of an annoyance. They feel like a permanent adolescent. They're very emotionally immature. This is a 50-year-old person who's on Instagram and still cares that people like them. Like very, very childlike. This is the person who may very well, after a divorce, start dating people who are inappropriately young for them. They just need validation. They can be a bit of a headache to co-parent with, but they may even also start getting bored with their role as a parent, and they may not be quite as mean. But as we keep going up this continuum and we get to the heavy malignant side of things, this is where things can get downright dangerous. When we get to the more malignant side of things, these are people who are actually manipulative and exploitative. They may actually have the muscle, the power, whatever, to work the court system in a way that they not only get disproportionate custody, they could potentially even get full custody. They can really stick it to you financially in a divorce. They may pass really poor, um, a problematic rumors about you that even though even though you might be able to stop it, then damage can be done to you in terms of reputation. They can say terrible things about you to your children. It's like they don't follow any rules. It almost feels psychopathic. Obviously, people who are dealing with this, this malignant pattern in a co-parent are dealing with something far more unsettling and potentially dangerous than people who are dealing with more of this ridiculous, immature kind of nonsense. But none of this feels comfortable. Okay. Now there are different types of narcissists. And before I sort of, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to another slide because as I walk through, because then you can sort of get two pieces of information at once since we only have an hour. The type of narcissist you're dealing with matters when it comes to co-parenting. Okay. A grandiose narcissist is the one that's like, I'm the king of the world. Look how great I am. Want to take a ride in my new Tesla? I'm so cool. Like it's that person. Everything is about putting on a show. They like to win people over. They want validation. They, they may continue to try to win over your friends, even though you split up. They want to be popular around the school. They want to purchase things and experiences for the children. There's very much sort of the Disneyland dad, Disneyland mom kind of um, model that could play out with the grandiose narcissist. But what you'll see is that they'll get very frustrated. They might get quite frustrated with your kids. Grandiose narcissists like the idea of kids. I don't think that they like all the, the inconvenience of kids. So that's why even if once you were, when you were married with this person, you saw how the bulk of the child rearing may have fallen on you because they sort of basically wanted their children paraded at convenient times. Like, oh, I wanna play with them now, like they're a doll versus really being present with them. This is tough because they're always devoting so much effort to looking good to the world, but they're still very, very, very difficult people. And you see that they're superficially engaged in the act of parenting, but they're not truly present with the kids. Malignant narcissists, this is where you see the narcissist who not only has some of the grandiose patterns, but they can also be very exploitative. They can really like, again, they can try to get information on you to try to use against you in court. They might hire private detectives to sort of get information from you. They will be stalking your social media to find that one moment of weakness. They'll find loopholes in the divorce law to make sure that you don't get all the money that would be normally given in a divorce and might be willing to spend tens, if not hundreds of thousands of more on a divorce to make sure you don't get that money. They'd rather give it to the lawyers than you. They'll use the courts to punish you by manipulating custody agreements and financial arrangements. They may not even be interested in having the child. They just want to hurt you. 
this is going to be an incredibly difficult co-parenting arrangement because much of what motivates them is winning and hurting the other co-parent. With the covert narcissist, they tend to remain sullen victims for years after the divorce. They, they want, you're one more person who's let them down. You're one more person that shows them that the world is terribly unfair to them. The struggle is that they will share this victimhood with your children. And your children, depending on how impressionable they are, just their own psychology, your child's own psychology, may start potentially seeing you as the bad guy who did something so terrible to their other parent. Like, well, was it really that bad, mom? Like, dad's really having a hard time. And your children may go into adulthood really struggling with guilt. The communal narcissist is a unique kind of a narcissist. The communal narcissist is the narcissist who gets their validation by being perceived as a do-gooder to other people. Like, wow, what a nice guy. He coaches the little league or he gave such a big donation at the silent auction or wow, she's super mom and she volunteers to do everything. But the thing that's motivating them is not the goodness of the task, not the love of the children or the love of the baseball or the love of the school. It's the need for validation. They do these humanitarian things so they can get validation. And in fact, can really be rather nasty people behind closed doors. When you are in a relationship with a communal narcissist and you're co-parenting with them, a lot of people may view your ex as almost like a hero. Oh, they do so much. They do so much for everyone. Wow. I'm sorry you guys split up, but I'm sure it's going well. And talk about feeling gaslighted. It could be just as difficult with any of these narcissistic types but the world thinks this person is sort of a modern day Mother Teresa. Communal narcissists continue to get their identity from their children. I'm super parent, look at me, and they'll look quite virtuous and they'll snap the pictures and they'll put them on social media. They like to parade around their parentness as it were, but they don't really want to do the work. They like the photo ops. They like volunteering at the school events where there's lots of other people around. But in terms of the day-to-day -day hard yards, the brushing the teeth, the eating the broccoli, and the doing the homework and the meltdowns, not so interested. And so they'll be a very publicly involved parent, but they will still engage with the kind of, again, the undermining of you, the criticism of you. And you might remember this pattern from your marriage of like, Everyone thinks this person's a hero. I can see what they're really about. And you often weren't even able to feel supported because people might view them still as so healthy, you know, and, um, and yet they still do, again, terrible things behind closed doors. The neglectful narcissists are people who, in essence, at one day cease to be interested in their partner anymore. Like they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm done. I got married. I got kids. Like I'm bored. I'm going to go do something else. And that something else might be a new partner. It might be work. They're just not interested anymore. And so they just walk away. People who are in relationships with neglectful narcissists often feel like they're sort of the unwatered plant. They're just left to die on the vine. And that, I mean, it, it's all these, these relationships can often come to very sort of quiet, sad ends. And in fact, the neglectful narcissist in some cases may not even fight you that much on custody. They're just not interested. They're just interested in what they're interested in. And they, let, they just sort of drop their responsibilities and kind of go on to the next thing. But where you'll see the pain is that they could really end up hurting your child by being deeply disengaged with them. So your child perceives this other person as their other parent. Well, why doesn't, why doesn't mom come to my school performances? Why doesn't dad come to my soccer games? And you find yourself having to do this arduous, painful task of having to explain this without, again, throwing the other parent under the bus. Generational or cultural narcissism is what we call more of an intergenerational cycle. We do know that there are cultures out there that tend to be a little bit more narcissist heavy. These are cultures that tend to be more authoritarian. They tend to be more patriarchal. They tend to be sometimes more tribe-like, meaning that if there will be family loyalty above all else, so they'll often protect the narcissist. But you may also see this pattern in people who've come from cultures where there might have been a lot of trauma, unrest, like the parents made horrific sacrifice originally to migrate maybe to this country. And then they, and these are your parents and, and subsequently they make sacrifices. Well, what ends up happening is if you, if you married someone like this who may have come from a very difficult background themselves, refugee, they left a tough situation, they came from a very, you know, narcissistic abusive home themselves. 
what could end up happening is you may fa face a lot of shame around the divorce. He's had such a hard life. Why did you have to leave him? You know, divorce is bad. We don't do that in our culture. So it's almost like these cultures coalesce around just enduring abuse for the sake of that's what the culture does without, you know, ensuring the safety of people within those families. And so even if there was violence, no matter what it was, you shouldn't have gotten divorced. And you can see intergenerationally then how these cycles get put into place. And so there could be ongoing attempts to keep you in a very controlled family dynamic, even though you split up from this person. And you can see how those cultural patterns may emanate from your um, former partners, uh, from your, I should say your co-parents life. So like I said, I promised you, I'm gonna teach you a way to talk about this without saying the word narcissist. Now you're not gonna walk around saying caved because some people might find that odd, but it's an acronym. And this acronym takes in a lot of the territory of how we can talk about narcissism. A lot of therapists don't even like to say this word. So what caved stands for is conflictual or high conflict, A for antagonistic, V for vulnerable, E for entitled, and D for dysregulated, meaning that's where we see all the rage and the acting out and the poor boundaries and all of that. This acronym can give you a way to say, okay, how do I explain my situation to a therapist, a teacher, a court setting, whomever, without saying the nasty word? Words like antagonistic hold a lot of, hold a lot of bang for the buck because it's not saying narcissistic but it actually is kind of in secret code speak. Like if someone came up to me and said, oh, my sister's really antagonistic. I'd be like, oh yeah, I got you. But a judge may not view this word as in such a problematic way. So you might be able to say something like, we're struggling a little bit to come to a parenting agreement or to adhere to the custody agreement because of there's some patterns around antagonism and there's some issues around dysregulation that make co-parenting difficult. You can blind them a little with this technical terminology and then not get labeled as the bad, difficult parent by using a word like narcissism. It's a little trick to keep in your pocket because then it also gives you a way to talk about the patterns in the relationship without dropping what I call the N-bomb, you know, like without saying that word that's, oh, why are you saying that? That's very clinical. You can't diagnose someone. It's a narcissism is actually not a diagnosis, but instead of getting into some long semantic discussion, having some of these other adjectives at your disposal can give you a way to talk about this. Like a teacher might say, you know, I'm noticing some interesting distractions. Some weeks they're more on than others. Instead of saying to the teacher, yeah, that's because my son's, you know, because my co-parent, you know, the other parent of this child is narcissistic. Now the teacher is going to say, well, you're not very nice. Um, instead, you could say, yeah, we're struggling a little because dad can be a little antagonistic, which has made consistency a little bit difficult, is a little vulnerable. So it's a little difficult to give him some feedback. And so I'm wondering, teacher, if you have any ideas for how to communicate about this, because then you can also work with the other stakeholders instead of them saying, oh, well, this is just a mean mom who's coming in and saying that, um, that the, husband's, the ex-husband's narcissistic, which they may sort of shut down on. I think an important thing for parents to know though, because a lot of you may be wondering, well, how, how, how did my co this, this ex, ex partner of mine become difficult and narcissistic? And how do I try to stave this off in my own child? One of the tricky bits here is that many times people are like, I don't want to know why they're like this because I don't even want to feel guilty about this. This person treats me badly. I agree with that 100%. I don't care in some ways why they became this way because we have to judge their behavior on how they're treating you now. But that said, you understanding where this comes from can give you a little bit of insight and also help you think about how you're going to parent your child. So there's multiple pathways to a person becoming a narcissist in adulthood. One of the most classical is when we see children who are both over and underindulged, okay, over and underindulged. And by that, what we mean is that the child may get wonderful experiences, fabulous holidays and private schools and wonderful toys and their own bedroom and all that stuff. But the child is emotionally underindulged. 
And by that, I mean, nobody talks to them about their feelings that the child only is like, you know, they they grow up in all this wonderfulness and, but there's no, there's no sense of talking about feelings. There's no one there to support their emotions. And in fact, one thing we often see is that not only are their emotions underindulged, that when the child who goes on to become a narcissist, when they were younger and they went to their parent and they would say, mommy, I'm sad. Instead of mommy sitting down and saying, honey, tell me about that. Can you talk to me about your feeling? Mommy would say, I feel so sad now. Now what has mommy done? Mommy has inserted her feeling into the child. And now the child does not know how to discern self from other in that way. And so as a result, they then forever become dependent on validation from other because they don't even have, they didn't never get, they never got to develop that inner emotional world. That's a lot of what happens in those cases. This sometimes happens because either the parent is narcissistic themselves or is distracted by whatever else they're distracted by. So that's one way they get there. The other is a painful one. It's what we call adverse childhood experiences, which can include things like trauma, neglect, abuse, exposure to any of these states, like for example, watching parents in a violent relationship. This can be difficult because it plays on a lot of our feelings. Like I feel bad for this person. They've had a terrible childhood. It's no wonder they're struggling with this. And as a psychologist, I agree hundred percent. In fact, many of the adult narcissistic patients I work with clinically did have these. However, and so I'm getting paid to work with them, but I don't believe that these adverse childhood experiences are a rationale for abusing someone in adulthood. You have the responsibility to go get your stuff figured out, go get therapy, go get the help you need, but don't you dare lash out at another human being. They're not responsible for your pain. And so a lot of people though justify a narcissistic partner's behavior on the basis of this. They may learn to model this. They may have watched a narcissist, may have watched narcissistic parents, parents who were entitled, parents who were dysregulated, parents who just were plain narcissistic and they just replicate that behavior in adulthood. Many of you are wondering, great, well, this is not, this, this is terrifying because that's what my kid is, has been seeing. Kids, people have come this way because of conditional worth. The child learns, and this relates to extrinsically focused parenting. The child learns that I'm loved because I make a lot of goals for the soccer team. I'm loved because I'm gonna dance the lead in the nutcracker. I'm loved because I get really good grades. I'm loved because I'm pretty. And that child learns that their love is linked to an external outcome and it becomes very extrinsically focused into adulthood. They remain focused on these extrinsic outcomes. Another path to narcissism in adulthood is again, this idea of overparenting, hovering over a child, never letting them experience disappointment. Some of you may have had ex-partners who grew up like that. Nobody wanted the precious child to ever even have their feet hit the ground. It's a terrible thing to do to a child. Disappointment is where children learn to regulate emotion. And that's another pathway. And finally, enabling. That basically the family enabled the narcissist in the family. Nobody ever called it out or never explained to the child, this isn't okay. Not only do families enable narcissists, societies do as well. So when we look at this all sort of together, in this one model, does everybody who experiences adverse childhood experiences become narcissistic? Not by a long shot. In fact, most probably don't, but some do. So none of these paths are a guarantee. A child could be raised in any one of these ways and not end up narcissistic, but taken together, all of these tend to, in one way or another, explain how many people got there. Um, uh, again, you can see that the stories can be quite different. So what happens to your child? Because that's a question many of you have. If this is my co, if this is my um, co-parent, what does this mean for my kids growing up? I'm going to say the bleak thing here. It's not good. All right, growing up with a narcissistic parent is one of the worst things that can happen to a child, because many times no one explains to this kid what's going on. The most likely thing that happens to a child who grows up with a narcissistic parent is that they grow into an adulthood where they're more prone to what we call negative mood states, like being more anxious, maybe a slightly greater likelihood of being depressed, but they really struggle with, am I good enough? Did I do that right? Am I perfect enough? Like there's a lot of that kind of fear because the narcissistic parent was so unpredictable that they sort of feel very anxious about that. Another issue that can come out of having had a narcissistic parent as a child is that child goes on to become an enabler themselves. They cut people slack. 
They give people too many second chances. The same way they had to justify their narcissistic parents' behavior when they were a child to try to make sense of it. In ad as adults, they go on to enable other people, which not only puts them at risk for taking a job with a narcissistic boss, but it also puts them at risk for marrying a narcissist themselves. These cycles tend to replicate in families. And so they may have done so much justifying as a child, they become really good at justifying a partner's behavior when they're adults. Another thing we sometimes see is dysregulation, that the child goes on to become an adult who struggles with strong moods. They may struggle, for example, with drugs and alcohol because they don't know how to manage their moods well. They may struggle with eating issues that could either culminate in an eating disorder from the perfectionism they thought was there that they needed to be, or just to be able to get some control out of what feels like an out of control situation. They may have trouble with anger, and that can go one of two ways. They may do something we call anger modulation, pushing their anger down too much. They don't even feel they have the right to express it, or they can't control it. And finally, yep, there's a subset of kids who are going to go on to become narcissistic themselves because they had a narcissistic parent. A child can grow on to grow into an adult that has multiple of these patterns. And because I work with a lot of survivors of um, family or family of origin narcissistic abuse, I'll sometimes see most of these patterns in one person. Like I'll see that they're anxious, they're dysregulated, they married a narcissist, and they continue to justify other people's behavior. You're probably thinking, okay, so we're doomed. You're not doomed. I think the anxiety piece is a hard one to avoid. You'll see some of that. But as a, as a co-parent, one thing you can do is to never gaslight your child. When your child says, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what to do. Mommy or dad is so, they're always so angry. Instead of saying, well, they don't mean it. No, somebody's yelling at you. They mean it, okay? It's to say, let's talk about it. Give them an opportunity to talk about their emotions, their feelings, how, you know, how they're experiencing this. Let them vent, okay? Explain to them it's really hard, but above all else, explain to them it's not their fault. That there's sometimes adults who just can't get it together, who cannot figure out how to appropriately express their emotions. And that's something for them to work on. You know, and that, and you might even use peer examples and all of that, but you don't need to gaslight your kids. And a lot of kids who grow up with narcissistic parents, no one ever explained it to them. So I'm going to sort of end on this, which is this idea of, I don't want my children to replicate the cycle and then maybe try to knock off a few questions and we can and sort of see what I, if I can help address any of that. I don't want this to happen to my kids. So a couple of things you can do. One, you've got to find every opportunity you can to cultivate empathy in your child. Empathy for others and empathy for themselves. In little ones, that could be things like board games. It could be reading a story with them and taking a pause and saying, well, how do you think the little girl felt in the story? Giving them as many opportunities to identify feeling and empathize with different characters and stories, films, even with adolescents, you can do that. Watch a film with them instead of just spreading when it's done. How did you feel about that? And have them talk about it. We don't talk about feelings enough. And in many cases in narcissistic fam family systems, when one of the parents is narcissistic, that gets pushed away. Support chances to talk about emotions. Teach them how to regulate their moods. And this can be different things. Team sports are a great way. You can't throw your helmet to the ground. Then you're not going to play in the next game. Team sports or other team and group-oriented exercises can help with this. Keep an eye on their entitlement. Well, everyone else is going to Coachella. That's great. And I hope they have a good time, you know, but it's this idea that I, sh I should have that. I should get that. Part of that societal, but part of that could also be what they saw in their own parent. You, it's your job. You're single parenting on this one. That's a tough one. Getting them involved in the community and volunteering so they can see the experiences of others, which is another opportunity to teach empathy. Having those conversations around the dinner and the breakfast table, now that you're no longer with the narcissist, you can actually have those more openly. It's another place to talk about emotion. Having clear expectations, because the times they're with their, the, your co-parent, things can might feel quite chaotic. When they know what's expected of them, they may rebel a little, but that's okay. It, it helps for them to, um, to have that opportunity. What I call the high-low exercise, have them talk about the best thing that happened that day and the worst thing that happened that day. It allows them to see that life has disappointment in, the, in it. It also has good stuff. It cultivates gratitude. It teach reg, teaches regulation. And above all else, what all of us as adults need to learn, which is mindfulness. And they desperately need that. 
And then I want to go back to this figure because I realized I didn't mention one thing, one other pathway your child could take if they have a narcissistic parent or what I'm calling antagonistic legacy issues. Your child can end up rebelling quite a bit. That might come out in things like the drug use and all of that, but they may become quite rebellious because they are so angry about the circumstance. So that's another pathway to look for, though that may run itself out in adolescence. Last thing I want to say. This was put together again by my friend Tina, who has a website called One Mom's Battle. And what she's done is she sort of created the cycle of what happens with a narcissist post-separation. And she does a really nice job of sort of laying out the different patterns we see after separation takes place and the kinds of abusive cycles you will see, including neglectful parenting and the discarding, the isolation, ongoing harassment, legal abuse, and so on. I'm hoping that even if all you, all you got out of this is just to have this little cycle, little thing that you can almost take a picture of and keep in your phone, to understand that these are actually universal cycles in people who experience narcissistic abuse and then have to co-parent with a narcissist can sometimes help you stop gaslighting yourself and feel like, okay, this is hard, but I'm not the only one going through this. And I actually highly recommend her website, One Mom's Battle, but it's, it works for moms or dads. Um, she has some good resources there for people who are having to negotiate particularly tricky co-parenting situations. I know we only have a few minutes left. I don't know if there's someone who can sort of help me sort through these questions, because I think there's been so many, I may not be able to see them all, but I'm not sure the best way to do the questions here. I don't know if there's someone moderating this where I can see this. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing there's some here and I'm going to work my way backwards. Okay. In terms of resources and tools and books, etc. All right. We have a list of resources I actually give to therapists. Some of it may be a little, you know, scientific for you, but I've no doubt you're all incredibly smart. I'm going to just give you the full bibliography I give to therapists that I train to do this work. And then you can sort through that. And there's a ton of resources there. Um, then there is what happens when your child watches you be a gray rock. They see you emotionless and they defend the other parent. This is a great question because this is what I was saying about like, Many of you will not get to walk this path unscathed. And I hate having to bring such a negative sentiment to this, but what I don't want you to do is sort of almost fight the impossible battles in some ways is that I would highly recommend, because again, we're running out of time, to go to this One Mom's Battle website and look up what Tina wrote about Yellow Rock. I found that to be a very interesting approach and her and I have talked about it at length in that it adds, it infuses a little bit more emotion into gray rock. So it's almost like your gray rock inside, but on the outside, it looks like there's a little bit more engagement. So it's not as destabilizing for your child. Now, the narcissistic co-parent is still going to be mad at you because they still can't get to you. They still can't bait you into the usual fights, but your child might see that fuller range of emotion coming out of you. When I tell you this is a hard one to learn, this is a hard one to learn. I'm asking you basically to learn how to walk a tightrope with a piano on your back. But I'm given that you've all survived a narcissistic marriage, I, I know you can do it. But I try that, infuse a little bit of emotion in that so your child doesn't fall into the other parent's narrative of, oh, mom is so cold or this other parent is so cold. Um, how can you defend yourself or gray rock in writing? Great question. Stick to the facts. Don't explain your intentions or motivations. That's one of the biggest mistakes people make, right? Because what happens is the narcissist makes a lot of accusations. You wanted this to happen to me. You expected this. You were trying to hurt me. No, you weren't. They, they, they don't get to assume that, but you don't tell them that. Nor do you defend that and say, I never meant to hurt you. I wasn't. No, 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 no. Facts. And that's why I say, in your mind, write the text or write the email twice. Write the dramatic, defendy, explainy version if you need to, then clean it up. It's like my students. I make them write 200 word essays. And they're like, I can't get it to 200. I said, sure you can. You're giving me a lot of fluff. You're lifting out all that defendy fluff and you're leaving it with just the facts. On Wednesday, da, da, da. Last Wednesday, da, da, da. We went to the museum uh, at 11 o'clock. <clears throat> That's it. As long as it was all followed, following the purview of your parenting agreement, they got nothing to say. I don't understand why you took them to a rock concert on a Wednesday night. Unless your parenting agreement says you can't take them to a concert on a Wednesday night, you don't have to defend that. 
You just, you just don't need to. And I think there's always a need to defend it. You don't, you're, you're not married anymore. You don't need to do that. Um, sometimes I feel like I could be the narcissistic one. Is that normal? Well, now that you know what narcissist, the list of things is, you get to do the deep dive to ask yourself, is this me? But sadly, so often people who co-parent with narcissists are told the biggest mistake you can make, I've got to tell you, never, ever, 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 ever. And if you've done it already, well, then I, it's nothing I can do. I can't put the genie back in the bottle. But never, ever say to your co-parent, I've read all this stuff and you're a narcissist. Because let me tell you, they're going to reload and they're going to say, no, you're the narcissist. And every argument from there forward is going to be how you're the narcissist. Calling you a narcissist when you're not is a form of gaslighting. But it's sometimes the narcissist has enough insight that they start doing some exploration and they're like, ooh, yikes. Okay, maybe that's what I am. Well, they don't like that. They don't want to be something bad. So they project it onto you. It's really on you to do the deep dive and say, am I entitled? Am I poor at regulating my emotions? If that's the case and you want to change that, then commit to the work of therapy. But if it's not you and you're taking in your partner's, your former ex-partner's narrative, pay attention to that, okay? Um, how do you tell a young child you can't be around the other parent, especially when the other parent is talking to the child about how you are welcome and they make it seem like you are the bad person? This question also goes back to that yellow rocking. Is that how, and, and this is where, because it's going to vary child to child, that what can be very useful is to break this down in therapy with someone to sort of reflect on the pros and cons. Many, many times this could be the other parent trying to suck you back in or continue to portray to the world the image, look, we're all great together. And yet for you, this feels very traumatic and triggering. You would really need to weigh out, for example, you may, you may need to be around them for a, to give a little school performance or there's something that you have to go and witness for the child, a game or something like that. And that might be all it is. But that you'd also want to say that, you know what, mommy and daddy are not married anymore or mommy and mommy, daddy and daddy. I don't know what your story is, but we're not married anymore. We both love you so, so much. We really, really do. But there's times that, you know, we're no longer married. So we keep our time separate. And so you get this special time with your other parent, which is so great, but we all don't need to be together at the same time. So make it more structural rather than making it personal. And I know we're at like one minute away. So please go to Tina's website. I mean, I, have, I think the world of her, she actually, she went through it. She's an advocate. She's not a therapist. She's an advocate. She went through this, one of the most malignant narcissistic divorces. She is actually, she wrote a book about it. So it's a first person book. There's some great, great resource there. Please go to my YouTube channel, you know, and what I can do here. And it's on the end. And the last I gave the, um, I gave all the uh, slides. And as you can see, we could have done this for seven hours with how much junk I have written here, but it's all very real. Those are my books. There's my website and my Instagram. But so please, you know, feel free, you know, read these books, go to these resources. We have lots of videos, but Tina's really the one who, if you want some of this very focused guidance, I highly advise you look at her stuff. Her and I work together in collaboration. So we're sort of, a, you know, we're very affiliated with each other. And, um, and like I said, I know that um, we got to go because it's noon and I know you're all incredibly busy. And um, so I, and I have to go see a client of my own. So I want to thank you again for your time and for this opportunity. And um, like I said, I'm hoping by getting those resources and everything out, follow us on social media. We're always putting out more guidance. And I do also do different webinars and stuff myself that you can go to. Just follow me on social media or YouTube and you'll see we put information out about them. So again, thank you so much for your time. And I wish you nothing but strength in this journey. You can do this. It's, it's, you love your kids. You'll do this, but do it the right way because it'll make it easier. Thank you. Bye-bye now.